very much for uh, coming. Uh, I'm Travis Samuels, I'm the director of the Centre for Bioethics and Medical Law here. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to our last seminar for this uh, this year. And this giant massive week. Uh, what better than this to be to look at a very different method of dying from uh, the one we focused on in the Dynamics Week uh, uh, last year when, uh, when we had Catherine Mannix talking about uh, palliative care uh, in the UK. Uh, and we could have no uh, better expert to illuminate it. On what's going on in Belgium, and uh, I think that is uh, Tone Almodor, who's Professor and Chair of Politics at Hull, and currently working uh, at uh, UCL uh, for uh, this academic year. Uh, I've discovered in uh, uh, having him as a guest today that he's a polymath of politics, and not only has uh, interests in medical ethics, but also uh, media ethics and uh, fact, anything to do with ethics in politics, and it's, uh, it's really good to uh, have uh, you with us this evening. I first met um, Raphael a few years ago when we had a, a residential conference here on uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide, which since those days has materialized into a book from Cambridge University Press in which uh, uh, Raphael, myself, and uh, two others in the room also have, uh, have uh, uh, chapters, and that's just come out in paperback within recent months, and, uh, and well worth a read. Um, Professor Kevin Almagor has a very interesting chapter on um, assisted suicide in those tired of life, and uh, without further ado, I will invite him to come and speak to us about uh, that topic of death as well. Thanks very much. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to be back at uh, St. Mary's. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Trevor, and for the invitation. And um, I'm going to speak today about, uh, about Belgium. Um, I've been studying end of life in nine countries. Um, Belgium came after the Netherlands. I, I published a book about the Netherlands. I felt that I, I said what I wanted to say, I have not, nothing else to add. So I needed a new horizon, and Belgium became my focus uh, uh, since at least 2016. Since 2016, now I'm Switzerland is my focus. So I moved to Switzerland now. Uh, but um, Belgium still remains fascination, and uh, I'm going to speak about what they do and some of the rationale and some of the problems. And as being a very practical person, I always, you know, provide some suggestion for the future if the. Not you, but if the Belgians would like to correct or amend something, then they can see with Maggie's help the, the lecture and then maybe can uh, implement something for change. So first, just to clarify that there is a difference between euthanasia and physician assisted suicide. I'm sure that you know this, but it's important to start. Euthanasia and physician assisted suicide are not the same. They are different matters. And the difference is important. I think it's e extremely important. It's extremely important if you fear abuse. Because the control mechanism with euthanasia is in the hands of the physician. The physician is doing the last act. So whether the patient liked it or not, he or she does not control what is going on. Especially when we are talking about patients who are you know, delirious, who are at the end of their lives, who are dying and so on. So they are susceptible to all kinds of manipulations. In physician assisted suicide, the patient has to do the last, the last act. So the medication is, is mixed within yogurt or ice cream or pudding, whatever, and then the patient has to digest the medication and kill him or herself. So that's a crucial difference between the two. In Belgium, we find both. The law speaks about euthanasia. There are few cases of physician assisted suicide. Not many, we're talking about dozens of cases out of the thousands of cases. So most of the time, the physicians prefer to perform euthanasia. What are my concerns? Uh, when I did research about Belgium, what are my concerns? So the first one, um, that's the changing of, of medicine. When you are legislating euthanasia, because medicine is, is to heal, is to cure, it's not to kill. 
So when you are changing the face of, of medicine, um, there are implications. Um, one of the implications in which the physicians in both uh, Netherlands and Belgium speak about, some would complain, is that they need to invest more time with the patients, something they didn't do in the past. Investing more time with the patient, I think, is an excellent thing. But there's also pressure on the nurses uh, to perform eugenesia because some physicians um, do not like to do that. So they impose that on, on, on nurses. Now, because of the hierarchy structure between physicians and nurses that also exists in this country, in every country in the world, then, of course, nurses are susceptible to such pressure. And that's a problem because the law says specifically that eugenesia should be formed by medics, by doctors, not by nurses. So that's one concern. Second concern is what the doctors know about euthanasia and euthanasia law. Um, the euthanasia law came about in 2002, and recent polls say that still there's a confusion about what is euthanasia among doctors. And I'll say something about this later. So doctors are confusing all kinds of terms, and when there is abuse, depending of, of course on the interpretation, there can be lenient interpretation of the abuse and then there can be harsh interpretations of the abuse. In the current system of Belgium, they tend to be lenient interpretation of the abuse, but of course this is worrying, the fact that there is still confusion about these things. Third thing is about inadequate consultation with in independent expert, and these are two things that are troubling here. One is the fact that it's still inadequate, and the second problem is the issue of independence. To what extent Actually, the second physician, the expert, is independent. And he, she needs to be independent from the first physician. Now, if they work together, or is some sort of relation between them, that's not independence. That means that the independence has been compromised. And uh, there are problems with the issue of independence. Fourth issue that is still problematic is the lack of no notification. We're talking about killing people, yes? So the least that they can do is to report this to make sure that people know that they, they've done what they've done. And again, it's been around for 16 years and there are still problem with reporting and notification. The, the numbers are going up, I should say. They used to be very low. And now I think that's about 65%. They are getting there, but we would like to aspire to 100%, of course, on notification. The fifth issue is the connection between organ transplants and euthanasia. Now, of course, you can, you can understand that euthanasia is the perfect uh, system if you are looking for organs. Why? Because it's planned. So you can organize everything. You can make sure that the people who are taking out the organs are going to be there on time, that the, the patient is going to be transferred to wherever he or she needs to be transferred, and if the procedure is done swiftly on the spot. So in that, in, in, in that respect, euthanasia is perfect for, um, for organ uh, transportation. The issue, of course, is to what extent patients are subjected to some sort of manipulation. Uh, we need your organs. Uh, you are now going anyway, so um, would you mind if you, can we take some parts of your body? You're going to help other people. Um, so in terms of, again, compromising and in terms of putting patients on the spot at times where they are very vulnerable, in terms of ethics, Trevor would agree it's problematic. Yes. Um, the sixth concern that I have is euthanasia of minors. Um, that was my last paper on this, published a few months ago. Um, I'm going to speak about this in length, but uh, they introduced a law, I mean, they amended the law. The law came about 2002. In 2014, uh, they decided to amend the law to accommodate also minors. Um, I should say that from the very start, or even before the 2002 law, there were discussions in Parliament, in Belgian Parliament and the medical circles, to what extent it is possible to discriminate against minors. That's the language that they're using. Uh, because we like to be universal and we like to have service for all and not to discriminate people upon age. So it's, the discussion started even before 2002 and continued throughout this period until they were able, because of political sort of considerations, have to do with the, the 
the Belgian parliament to have this way politically and to, to mend the law. What I found fascinating is the fact that they didn't limit the age of people, patients. So essentially, theoretically, um, a kid of nine years old can go to a doctor and demand euthanasia and get it, if, of course, the doctors agree to that. Uh, but I was struggling with the issue of age, and I was struggling with the issue of really at what, at what age people can give consent to, to die. Um, it's not a small feat, and I thought that it's an uh, issue that I should learn and study, and of course I, I did learn and study. The seventh issue is still an issue that troubles the Belgianists a great deal, and uh, I think that I'm going to amend the law again in the near future if this trend is going to continue, that has to do with uh, patients with dementia. Again, it's the issue of discrimination. You cannot discriminate and decide these patients uh, can have euthanasia, these patients cannot have euthanasia. So they bring this as a human rights issue. And they think that uh, people with dementia should have entitlement to, to euthanasia. I find it extremely problematic and I'm going to speak about this later. And the eighth issue is the issue of abuse. Um, I'm a political theorist, I'm a liberal. I strongly believe that people have the right to decide the moment of their death. That's my belief. I'm not talking about privileges, I'm talking about rights. So I and, and, and the language of rights is very, very strong. So I repeat, I think that people have the right to decide the moment of their death. Um, so for me, all this, in, ethically speaking, it is possible uh, to come to a doctor and have some sort of a rapport and ask for help. It's something that I have nothing against in principle. But I would like to make sure that the procedure is going to be kept only for the, for the people who want it. So there won't be any abuse. If there is abuse of the system and people who do not want to have euthanasia are killed as a result, that means that I can throw all the philosophy to the garbage bin because the policy doesn't work if there's abuse. So there's a very fine line between philosophizing somewhere there, you know, 10 feet on the skies, and on the ground when you have to implement a policy. And the shift between philosophy and policy is extremely important. So the, the policy should stand the test of philosophy and vice versa. If it doesn't, then I have grave concerns. And with Belgium, I have grave concerns. So let's examine the law. The, the Belgian had a model the neighbor, the Dutch, and more or less they copy and paste the Dutch law and brought it to Belgium. They study uh, from, from the Dutch. In Belgium, they've done it very, very swiftly. Um, I mean, maybe there was euthanasia before 2002, but we don't know. I'm not sure whether the Belgian know. I mean, the public doesn't know, that's for sure. But even experts, I'm not sure to, to know. Maybe some doctors know. Everything was done very, very quickly, uh, something out of the blue. They legislated six months after the Dutch. Now in Netherlands, um, by contrast, we knew, the world knew, that they were practicing euthanasia with, in the absence of law. There was no law, but they found all kind of, they called it overmacht, necessity to perform euthanasia. So even in the absence of law, they've been practicing euthanasia since the, the early 70s. So they have a lot of experience and a lot of practice, and the Belgian learned from the Dutch practice. So they just imported the Dutch law. So euthanasia is the international taking of someone's life by another on her request. So um, you see intention, you see uh, killing, and you see consent. That's three elements that are important here. It follows that this definition does not apply in the cases of incompetent people. And some of you are attentive to what I say, then raise the question and ask, hey, but you just mentioned that they are considering dementia. And, uh, are demented people, people with dementia, are competent or not competent? So how come that they are doing this? Well, they're going to amend the law, that's, that's the thing. That the proposed terminology is termination of life of incompetent people. But even here, it's very clear that it's not euthanasia. It falls under a different category, termination of life of incompetent people. Doctors today in Belgium are not aware of this distinction. More importantly, the act of stopping a pointless, futile treatment is not euthanasia. Again, doctors are not really aware of this. And it is recommended to give up the expression passive euthanasia in these cases because passive euthanasia is just confusing the entire discussion in Belgium. 
what was something called indirect euthanasia, forcing armed use of an analgesic with a possible effect of shortening life, is also clearly distinguished from euthanasia proper. Again, doctors today, 2019, are not clearly aware of this distinction, unfortunately. <laughs> The patient's physician needs to inform the patient of the state of his or her health and her life expectancy, discuss with the patient her request for euthanasia and the therapeutic measures which can still be considered as well as the availability and consequences of palliative care. This is extremely important. Uh, palliative care can sort out many issues before resorting to euthanasia. That's very nice on the paper, but unfortunately, it's not practice in all cases. So it's, it is practice in the majority of cases, but not in all cases, which is a, another problem. And then this is the amendment of the 2014, uh, that it will be applicable also to minors. So the minor patient with the capacity for discernment is in a medical future condition of constant and unbearable physical suffering that cannot be alleviated and will result in death within the foreseeable future and is the result of a serious and incurable condition caused by illness or accident. So purposely, you see, they decided not to mention any age criteria. It's just an open-ended. There are some criteria that repeat more or less the same criteria that are applicable to adults, but they didn't see that there is a difference between minors and adults. They assume that minors are capable to discernment, if they are, to the same extent that adults are. I contest these assumptions. Um, minors need to consult a child psychiatrist or a psychologist, inform her about the reasons for this consultation. Consult a special specialist is required to take note of the medical record examine the patient and verify the capacity for discernment of the minor, all the information included in the minor's request, and the agreement of her legal representative needs to be recorded in writing. All this is excellent. And it should be in any guidelines, of course, also to adults, not only to minors. The treating physician is required to inform the patient and her legal representative of the outcome of this consultation. At the meeting with the minor's legal representative, the treating physician provides the patient with all the required information and verifies that the representative agree with the request of the minor patient. Again, all this is excellent. The decision is request to request euthanasia must first put in writing by the parents and the family are offered psychological support. Now, when we speak about parents, it's not clear what happens when there is a disagreement between parents. Sometimes, you know, they don't agree on everything. They left it open what happens when there is disagreement between a husband and wife or between two partners. Uh, that's not clear. The FDA team needs to ascertain that the child has decisional capacity and whether the choice for euthanasia is the best option. A commission oversees the practice of euthanasia to ensure compliance with the governance procedures. What we do know that now we have sort of a history and trajectory of the practice of euthanasia in Belgium, we see the, 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 the rising numbers. So in the first year, there were 235. This was 0 0.2 of the old death in, in that year. And then as we continue with the practice and it become, the public is becoming more and more aware of the availability of euthanasia, and also there is more and more pressure on physicians to practice euthanasia, you cannot sit on the, on the fence. I mean, if you are a GP and you do not perform euthanasia in Belgium today, you are in a problem. You're going to face problem because the Belgian citizens is a human rights issue. So you need to help me. Uh, so we can expect in any country that legislates end of life, um, any form of end of life, physician assist suicide, assist suicide, euthanasia, we can expect that as the law continues and is still maintained, we can expect a rise. But this is quite a hike that is taken up. So 1,807 in 2013, and the last one, 2,357 cases in 2018. So there's a big difference, you see, between 2003 and 2018. 
uh, the number of the population actually didn't change very much, I think maybe by one million, but you see that there's a great um, jump in, the, in euthanasia. Now whether this is a cause for concern for the Belgians or not, I'll let the Belgians decide, but I think that the numbers do say something uh, to us. The report that was published by the Belgians in English, I can't read uh, Flemish or French unfortunately, I'm quite illiterate, was very concise, was very, very short. So many things are not known. I mean, I have hundreds of questions I would like to ask about 2018 report, but I simply don't have the tools to learn. So this is what I know from the very succinct report that they published. We know that 61.4% of the patients are cancer patients. Uh, that's not news, it always has been like this. So the number one category is cancer. And uh, the simple fact behind cancer is that it's very painful. And one thing that we dread is pain. We don't like pain, we don't like suffering. And if the option is that you'll be a zombie or you'll be in pain, then I think death is becoming more and more attractive proposition. So therefore cancer is always has been number one. And if you look at reports from other countries, especially from the United States, Oregon and others, you see again that cancer is number one. Polypathology is 18.6, uh, then the nervous system 8.3. In Oregon, the nervous system comes second rather than the polypathology. Diseases of uh, circulatory system 3.8, respiratory tract 2.4, psychological and behavioral disorder 2.4, which this thing is, again, if you look at you know, the incompetency requirement of the law, this is unclear. I mean, of all these cases, it has to be, they need to be studied one by one. Now, we know that you, people can suffer psychological order, disorders and still be competent. We know that. Because in the, when we have psychological disorder, it's not that it's, you know, rock bottom all the time. Usually it goes like this. There's, it's fluctuating, yes? So it, it may be the case that in, the, in the, the peak, when they are quite discernment and capable, that you have the discussions and they quite clearly the patients say, I want to die. But anyway, they deserve a lot of discussion and a lot of monitoring and inspection. Just the numbers are not enough. Request for euthanasia on the basis of mental disorders and behavior remain marginal 2.4 of all euthanasia cases. No children were euthanized. Um, where there were 14 deaths of people aged 18 to 29 and 10 deaths of people over 100. I should say that since the legislation of 2014 for minors, there are very, very few cases, at least reported. Very, very few cases, it's not something that, and the numbers are not going up at all. They are very, very, um, they are very, very minor. In the majority of cases, 85%, the doctor expected the death within the foreseeable future. So this has come within the um, definition of terminal patient. And now in the Western world, it's accepted that when you are tagging a patient terminal, that means that the forecast is six months, not more than six months. But usually when it comes to these kind of cases, from talking to Belgian physicians and researchers, they are speaking a matter of days or weeks. So we are not talking six months. It's much shorter than that. There were a few more women than men, but nothing that is going to cause any worry. It's not that there's a sort of a plan to get rid of women. No, it's not that. Just a slight uh, uh, more women than men. Um, most people prefer to die at home, of course. I mean, that's the, if I can uh, think of a dignified death, that will be in your bed at home surrounded by your loved ones. About one quarter of the deaths were attended by a specialist euthanasia doctor from LIFE, LIFE and information form. I'm going to say something more about this, but for me this is a worrying sort of thing because LIFE was established to help and provide uh, counsel for doctors, GPs who perform euthanasia. So why on earth only one quarter of the cases use this consultancy? I have no idea. But there is clearly a, number, a, a problem there and I'm going to reflect on this later in the, in the lecture. Less than 1% of euthanasia involved unconscious patients who made an advanced declaration. So again, all these cases, I think, should be studied very, very carefully. We're talking about a small number, but still, you know, in Judaism, you say, you say one person, 
as if you saved the entire world. So for me, as a Jew, uh, it's not that important a small number, it's important that it happens. So we need to look into these cases. My study showed me that palliative care is extremely important in all the process of end of life. Uh, for some patients, if you provide comprehensive holistic palliative care, there's no need for euthanasia. The only problem with palliative care is that it's expensive. So for instance, in places like United States, palliative care is not offered to the majority of patients. It's offered when only uh, patients are tagged as category three of cancer and up. So if you suffer from other stuff, you are not entitled to palliative care. That's supposed to be not the case in Belgium, uh, but still we have problem with palliative care. It's said to be one of the best in the world, um, but we see that palliative care specialists are involved in 71% of the euthanasia cases, and I wonder why. Why in 30% uh, there's no mention of palliative care? Maybe there are excellent reasons, but from the very short report that they published, I have no idea what's the reason why 30% have no indication of palliative care. I would like to know more information about that. We need to speak about the role of psychologists when someone asks to die. It's not the same that that person wants to die. I would say that many times it's a, it's a cry for help if someone wants to die. So therefore, the involvement of psychologists is part of the comprehensive, holistic treatment of palliative care. So I think the role of psychologists is instrumental and is extremely important in the process. And also in managing symptoms, um, pain, breathlessness, fatigue, side effects, um, to clarify issues of autonomy, coping with changes that are required because of the patient's condition. The patient has, is now needs to find himself in a new situation. And uh, uncertainty, of course, all these things are extremely important. We are body and mind, and we need to divide device away that is going to take not only of the body, we're well, not just a piece of meat, but also of the mind, and for this, the role of psychologist is extremely important. That does not mean that if you provide palliative care, necessarily that you are going to dissolve yourself of the need of euthanasia. That's not the case. I know that because of the research that shows that quite a few cases, especially in places like Oregon, we find time and again that we, if you have educated people who are uh, very minded people, strong minded people, would want to decide the moment of, the, of, of their death, and they know what is entailing them. They know that they, they cannot be saved, they're going to die in a matter of weeks or months. Uh, they would like to do that. So you can provide all the help in the world. They will tell you, I don't want it. I just want to die. So just help me. If you want to help me, just help me die. So I'm not saying that palliative care is the cure for everything, but I'm saying that palliative care is the cure for the majority of things you still will find patients who would go, would forego palliative care and will determine to die. So who is administering the drug? Um, and that's a problem because the law says that it should be physician and previous report showed that 12% in the cases, nurses in Flanders administer the drugs mostly without physicians co-administering. Now I'm saying Flanders, that's a qualification you know that um, Belgium is composed of three parts, essentially. There's uh, Flanders, Flemish, there's Bologna, French, and then there's Brussels that is mixed. Brussels is very big, it's the center of the country, the capital. So these are the three parts. We actually know very little about what's going in, in Bologna. I, a mystery to me. I'm trying to urge the Belgians to do more research in, in Bologna. I've been telling them years that I'm telling them and begging them, hey, do something about Bologna. Um, I don't know why they don't do it, uh, but they don't. And there's, so there's, we know very little about what's going on in, in Bologna. So you, this qualification of Flanders, you'll, you'll find time and again, if you look at, uh, at the Belgian research, you'll find that it's mainly in Flanders, it's not in Belgium. I mentioned the issue of consultation. Um, the consultant has to be independent. Now the role of, in the, of the independent consultant is, is, is dual role. It has to verify, he has to verify that it's the hopeful, uh, hopeless condition of the patient and that 
the patient wants to die. Now, from a research in the Netherlands, and now I'm going back in history, that's a research that I conducted between 1999 and 2002, I found that there were some times where the consultant was fulfilling the purpose by phone. And when I heard it for the first time, I was utterly puzzled. What do you mean by phone? With whom does the consultant speak? I said, well, the first job, doctor. Of course, with the first doctor. I said, so how can you ver verify the voluntariness of the patient if he speaks only to the first, to the first doctor? Possible. Can, can be. So when I was asking the same question about Belgium, to say whether they, you know, they do this by phone, I said, no, 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 we don't do that. But they whispered in my ear that sometimes they do that. So that's, it depends whom they believe. So, and the issue of independence is still something that bugs me. I'm not uh, entirely clear about the issue of the independence requirement, whether it's satisfied or not, because, I mean, just the hassle. You know, think about uh, a GP that has to entertain, I don't know, five euthanasia cases per month. I'm not saying that he's going to perform five euthanasia cases, entertain, consider five euthanasia cases. Does he, he's going every time to look for a different doctor? Or he's going to have some sort of a rapport with one doctor? You're going to consult my patient, I'm going to consult your patient. You know? Do a little sort of way. And that's how they, they, they do this. I mean, they've done it in the in, in Netherlands. I presume it works similarly also in Belgium. Now, Belgium learned the lessons of Netherlands. That's why they invented life. But you saw only 30% of the cases that go to life. So I have no idea why they do that in this way. It bugs me. So in his life, since 2003, so it's one year after the law. But you see, there's no rules regarding who decide the identity of the consultant. So they, they did life, and the life is a, a consortium of specialists on euthanasia who can be the consultant if you need a consultant to perform euthanasia. So that's why it was devised. So all the GP needs to do is to open a book or internet or God knows what, go to the LIFE website, find a doctor that is more or less in the region, and call him or her. That's what they need to do. And somehow they do it only in 30% of the cases because they are free to decide that they need to consult now. Now, for me, that's a loophole that should be fixed. Um, and of course, they're going to approach like minded physicians. I mean, if you know that the doctor... Van Lewis is not going to perform euthanasia ever in his life, you're not going to call him. You are going to call only those who know, you know that are supporting euthanasia. Another problem, at least in the past, and because the 2018 law uh, report is so succinct, so there's no information about it, but in the past 35% of the cases, physicians did not consult at all independent uh, uh, specialists. And again, there's no, there's no data in the 2018, but in the past, there in 23% in of the cases, there was disagreement between the first and second position. So the second position did not agree with the conclusion of the first position. The reports don't tell us what happens. So that we have 23% of the cases where there's a disagreement, but they don't tell, me, tell us what would be the conclusion. Do they opt for life? Do they opt for death? What happens? How they decide is total unknown. Yes? Where is that 23% taken from? That's a report, earlier report. I think it's 2000, either 2010 or 2013. So one of the previous reports. I said 2018, I don't have the numbers. I don't know. You can find all information in my articles. They are available online. <coughs> Reporting. Um, so there's one committee. Uh, Unlike Netherlands, when they have regional committees, in the Belgium they devise just one committee, national committee. It's called National Evaluation Control Commission for Euthanasia. That's supposed to oversee all the cases um, of euthanasia in the country since the establishment of the law, meaning since 2002. And they need to study all the, all the cases, examine them, and see that there's no abuse. Until now, they found zero abuse. Wonderful. Round, beautiful number. I think last year there's one case that uh, they found suspicious and is now in, in line, but it's, it seems that all is fine in the Kingdom of Belgium, according to the National Evaluation and Control Commission for Euthanasia. So I salute Belgium. I never argue with France. 
According to 2010 report, approximately half of all estimated cases of euthanasia were reported to the Federal Control and Relation Committee. So, you know, it's a great number, 50%. In 2013, it's risen to 63.5% of euthanasia cases. Uh, I don't know about the current numbers. Now, organ transplantation. I, I told you it's, it's great for organs, and I support. Yes, I have an Eddie card. I support organ donation if I'm killed. You know, you know now, you can do with my body whatever you want. I give it to science. You can take everything that is worthwhile taking, take, enjoy, save other lives. So I have no problem with this issue of the connection between euthanasia and organ um, transplant. But I am very much conscious of abuse, of manipulation, of putting patient on the spot, especially when the patients are not in their best, and they are not at their best. They are frail, they are fatigued, they are suffering. They have many issues and many problems. And suddenly you put them in the corner and said, can we take your organ? No, I, I don't like that. I, as to the same extent, I would not take organs from prisoners, although some prisoners um, would like to do that. If, you, if the issue of consent has been compromised, then I have an issue with that. Now look at the numbers, 23.5 of lung donors in Belgium after euthanasia. Quarter, almost a quarter. But I, I want to know something about these numbers. I find it staggering because um, there are not that many euthanasia cases in, in Belgium. It's 0 0.2, 0 0.4 maybe, but you know. But a quarter now are donors of lungs. That tells me something. 2008 of heart transplants also fall on euthanasia. So that's I'm less worried about. Euthanasia donors accounted for almost a quarter of all lung donors. My first case accounted for 0.49 of all deaths. Again, why this happens, I did not see a single study stemming from Belgium about this issue. Not a single study. I just know the numbers, but I, know, I don't know the story behind the numbers. But I think that there is a story, and I would like to know something about it. So this is the last thing that I've studied in Tunisia of minors. Um, I have to say that I changed my mind about this. Um, Sometimes I'm, I'm a man of facts, so I come with ideas. But if I'm you know, confronted with facts, and the facts contradict my ideas, the ideas are going to the garbage, the facts replace the ideas, and I have new ideas. So when I started my study, I was very much against. My hunch was that, no, it's, something is, is very bad, very wrong here. That was my hunch, when well, I was wrong. So I, I made some qualification. I'm, I'm not terribly happy with the law, but I can understand the logic of the law. So this is the serious question that I started with. Do minors have capacity for agency? Are they able to make decisions concerning life and death? Can minors understand death? Are minors capable to weigh various alternatives for treatment? Are there sufficient mechanisms to place a certain uh, that the best interests of minors remain intact? I have to say that many of the questions, the answer is yes. And I thought the answer would be no. But after my studies, and I went fascinating, I started to do brain studies for this wonderful research. So I went into brain studies, the, the field of brain studies. It's a fascinating and growing and great field of study. You can just immerse yourself for ages just in that field. But from my understanding is that there is a case for minors, but I'm still troubled, and you see the remedies that I offer three rem remedies to do it better, in my opinion, than what the Belgians are doing now. So these are other questions I've asked. Is there a difference between adult euthanasia and child euthanasia? Does life experience matter? Fundamentally, the question relates not only to minors' capacity to make such life and their decisions, but also to safeguards against abuse. Again, I'm very concerned about the issue of abuse. I would like to see that there's no abuse done. Now, <coughs> dementia. Between 2002 and 2013, a total of 179 cases of psychiatric disorder or dementia were identified. Although it is a legal requirement to do so, a psychiatrist was not consulted in all cases with the diagnosis of psychiatric disorder. I should also just remind you that the law speaks about competent patients. And uh, I, well, the issue of competency when it comes to patients with dementia is very much under debate. Um, and I'm not, at least not until now, from what I studied, I'm not persuaded 
and I'm not persuaded because of what I call the paradox of the main germ. And this is the paradox. Essentially, you can divide the stages of dementia to three stages. So the first stage is, is when a dementia has been identified. So we're talking about usually a patient uh, with, with 60s, 70s, 80s, who is becoming forgetful. Um, he forgets the keys, he forgets the phone, he forgets the money. We all do that. Yeah. But then the frequency increases, and sometimes he forgets the name of the street in which we live, and sometimes forget the name of his wife. So this is the concern starting to rise. This is the first stage. Now, when you're looking at the requirements, whether the patient is autonomous, yes, he is. So that's satisfied, that's wonderful. Suffering, well, is he suffering or she suffering? I don't think so. So I don't think there is any suffering that justify euthanasia to the extent that is going to go to, um, to kill yourself. I mean, of course, there's some, some, some sort of suffering, but it's not to the amount that would justify killing yourself. So there's a plus, but only one plus. Required care, yes. Providing euthanasia time, everyone, every doctor that I discussed in God knows how many countries, I've been to nine countries, in dozens of centers, not even a single doctor, even in Belgium and Netherlands and in Switzerland, told me that in the first stage of dementia, it would be justified to kill the patients. So therefore, my resolution is that in the first stage of dementia, this is problematic. Now we come to the second stage of, of dementia. The second stage of euthanasia does not have any time limit. It, it, it's clearly that now the person has dementia. It's not a question mark. We now have exclamation mark. We know the person suffers from dementia. So we, we, this person demands more care, and there's more suffering because it involves a lot of confusion, a lot of fatigue. It's not nice not to recognize what's going around you. And people tell you about events that took place under the assumption that you remember, and you don't. So there is clearly suffering, there's more suffering in the, in the second stage. The second stage can last years. Okay, it's not a, 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 something that is going to be rubric in, in weeks or months. It can last for years. The development can be very, very slow. It's going to deteriorate, but it can be very slow deterioration. Of course, there's required care. More care is required. Providing euthanasia at this point of time, this is where it becomes questionable. So it depends. So in Belgium and Netherlands, some physician would tell you, and, and Switzerland, they would tell you that at that point of time, especially in the later stages of the second stage, um, then maybe euthanasia is warranted. So that's why I'm saying it's questionable. Because it's questionable, my conclusion is euthanasia for, uh, in terms of the ethical aspects, it's problematic. And then the third stage, the third stage, I hope that nobody in present in this room, including me, will ever get to that stage. It's awful. It's really, really terrible. This is a great amount of suffering. There's no autonomy. Now, in all my writing, I insist on the issue of autonomy. I'm a liberal. So for me, everything stems from the individual, everyone, everything returns from, from the individual. But it's individual who has a mind, who can think, who can argue, who can stipulate, who can make decisions, who understands, who has a conception of the good. This is lacking. There's no autonomy. You can't speak of autonomy. So I, for me, it's an absolute no-no. Of course, there's more care is uh, needed. In terms of the time, yes. I mean, some of the patients that, that you see, you, you really think that you know, it's really agonizing for them, for the families, for everyone, for the, for the staff, for the medical staff. But because the autonomy is, is missing, then my conclusion again, in terms of the ethical aspects, that the dementia, to less for a patient with dementia, is problematic. So I call it the dementia paradox. So I don't believe that people with dementia should be killed at any stage. That's my conclusion. And I'm waging a fight because at least in Belgium and Netherlands, 
it seems that there is a great mass that believe that they do. And there is now a call in parliament and so on to, to move ahead with euthanasia for patients with dementia. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, presumably someone is going to come up with, well, we need to get advanced consent at the first <coughs> stage. Yeah. Um, do people do that? Yes, of course. And if they do, how can you tell whether that consent is enduring then? You can't. I mean, there are, there are liberals like Ronald Dworkin, maybe you know the name. No. Um, so Dworkin was, he, he published a book called Life's Dominion in, in 1993, and in his book, in Life's Dominion, he claims that if you need to decide between the autonomous patient who voices an opinion, or the patient in the later stage who is no longer autonomous, the autonomy of the patient prevails. That's what he says. So we, need, we, are not, we are going to ignore the patient that we have now that may give you signs of at least enjoyment when she eats ice cream, when she stares at the television. Because sometimes they have some flickings in which they recognize, so their grandson will run to her and she says, oh, Tommy, and she hugs him. The walking will ignore all this. Because what's important is the advanced directives that was done in the first stage. Ethically speaking, ethically speaking, it's questionable. Yeah. In Belgium and Netherlands, this is their view of many, many people, of medics, of nurses, of experts, of, of medical ethicists, of the establishment of parliament. And the, the number who believe in that are growing, and therefore there's a push towards legislation. So I would not be surprised. Uh, the only thing is who is going to do this first? Is it going to be Belgium or Netherlands? <laughs> Other than that, I, I have little hesitation to think that they are not going to do that. I think they're going to go ahead with that. They believe it's, it's the humane thing to do. But I've, I've met with enough physicians who, who deal with uh, people with dementia in nursing homes, and they say they would never do that. They, they understand the problem. They understand the paradox. But they, they will find some people who are going to do that. When you look, again, it's, they're not publishing this. But if you think that there are 2,000 cases of euthanasia, and that means there are 2,000 GPs involved, then you are wrong. Okay, the number of actually people who prescribe and do that is much smaller than that. So it, I met a doctor that proudly, in Netherlands, proudly told me that he killed 25 patients in 1999. And he saw this as a case of pride. Abuse. So when there is a case, I told you it's very rare that they uh, think that something is wrong in, the, in Belgium. But here there was one case, they think that some people at least thought that it was wrong. A patient with severe dementia who also had Parkinson, he never asked for euthanasia, so there was no request, never advanced the record, no nothing of that, and he was euthanized. He was euthanized because the family asked for euthanasia. Now, for me, this is a great breach of the law. If you read the law, it says explicitly there's to be the voluntary request of the patient. So that's a violation of the law. I can understand that it's difficult for the family. I, I can appreciate that. So therefore, you should put the patient in a certain home that are going to care. People who have expertise is to care for patients. That's what you need to do. Not to alleviate the problem by eliminating the patient. God forbid. The commission declined to refer the case to the public prosecutor to investigate if criminal charges were warranted. And this is where we come to the name William Distelmans. You know the William Distelmans? I used to correspond with him until he understood who I am, so he stopped. <laughs> um, so William Distelmans, he is the head of the commission. That was his reasoning. I mean, it's fascinating. The doctor treating the patient mistakenly called the procedure euthanasia. He should have called it palliative sedation instead. That was the rationale. He simply ticked the wrong rubric. That was his mistake. And for ticking the wrong rubric, of course, it's not a criminal act. We all tick wrong rubrics. Nobody's going to be prosecuted by ticking because we ticked the wrong rubric. That's the only thing that the doctor does wrong. Other than that, he was perfectly right in whatever he provided the patient.
Um, palliative sedation is something that worries me a great deal. And to tell you the truth, it's far more worrying than euthanasia. Because with euthanasia, at least, um, there's, there's a lot of clarity. I mean, I have many questions, but there's a lot of clarity. And if it does correctly, then the patient knows what to expect. The patient, let's take classic case, has cancer, um, is defined terminal, meaning that life expectancy is less than six months, probably less, much less than six, six months, is suffering, the only way to alleviate suffering is by making it a zombie, sedating him and so on. So he says, I want to organize a party, I want to say farewell, and I want to ask my GP to kill me at my home, to euthanize me. And if it's done and performed, you know, I, have, I don't have major problem with the issue per se on this particular case that I described to you now. With terminal sedation, the patient has no idea that he's going to die. Nobody tells him. It's the decision of the medics and the medics around, well, all the nursing uh, care around the bed. They decide that he will die. So he doesn't even have a chance to say farewell to his family. And I found this agonizing. Now, if you look at the numbers, the numbers are going up. Not only um, of, of this, but all, everything is, is going up. Since the enactment of the Euthanasia Act, it was following increasing all types of medical end-of-life practices, euthanasia, intensified alleviation of pain, withholding and withdrawing life along the treatment, continuous or deep sedation until death, with the exception of use of life-ending drugs without explicit request. That it still exists, but it doesn't go up. Which, of course, that's a great violation of the law, because request has to be there. So, we should do a lot of research about palliative sedation, what is entailed, and terminal sedation. Uh, some doctors in this country, in England, refuse the, to use the term terminal sedation because they think it's unethical. Sedation is not intended to kill, and when you call it terminal sedation, of course the intention is within the term. You intend to kill the patient. Otherwise, you wouldn't, you'd not call it terminal sedation. The Belgians are not aware of these subtle differences. So here are my proposals, and this is really the trust of the matter. Um, these are the questions. Would there be a need for euthanasia if care were better organized? And I'm speaking about palliative care, life, and all the constituents of, of what's going on. Is there a culture of death in Belgium that uh, prevails and that facilitates uh, the trouble and information I just gave you? Um, beneficians versus non Maleficians, uh, what guides their uh, decision-making processes. And I titled this lecture, Do Not Harm, because of all the principles of medicine and good doctoring, that's the, for me, it's the first principle of the good doctoring. Do no harm. Just try your best not to do harm. Um, palliative care for me is the key, it's a very important key, and I've studied that, so in Flanders, again, we don't know about Bologna, about 10,000 patients receive daily palliative care. That's a large number. It's very expensive. So 10,000 patients each and every day, that's a burden on the taxpayer money. There's insufficient financial support from the Belgian government to local and national palliative care initiatives and research. There's a lack of palliative care guidelines and standards for palliative care education. The issue of palliative daycare services, meaning that you go in, you go out the same day, is relatively new in Belgium and can be improved. And in Flanders, no specialist uh, accreditation for palliative care professionals. All these I find problematic and can be redeemed. Of course, they need resources. But if all these things will be redeemed, I think that Belgium will be in a better position. And, you know, uh, people who are uh, not zealots would agree with everything that I said here in Belgium. I've tested it. Palliative care knowledge and expertise of the average physician is limited. Um, the GP, the, the, most of the GPs, they receive very limited training in palliative care. And some specialists of other staff don't think that they should have any expertise because they, they know what they're doing. So to provide this kind of training is something that's very, very important because at the end of the day, these are the GPs who are performing the majority of euthanasia cases. 
So they need to know how to do it because I think that, in, again, in a substantial number of cases, there is no need for euthanasia if uh, palliative care is, is comprehensive and holistic. Um, when you are providing this palliative care, and I'm talking about combination of body and spirit and, and the well-being of the patient, seeing it as a whole, then the patient will cope more effectively with their conditions. And of course they need, when you're talking about palliative care, they need support for the distress, for the anxiety, for the helplessness, the hopelessness, the fear of death, and all the psycho-spiritual well-being. All this is very, very important. And this is what, we, what I call comprehensive palliative care that includes addressing all these issues, um, closure and uh, family and uh, pain and all the rest. With regard to consultation, so we need to study the issue of independence and the relationship between the first and the second doctor, who is the consultant, and whether independence has been um, compromised. And how can we see that life is going to be performing its job better, meaning that GPs are going to approach them 100% of the time, rather than just a quarter or, or a third of the time. So when they did a poll, how many physicians are actually aware of the existence of life, we see that almost 80% are aware of it, still only 35% are approaching life. So why, why this is happening? And why it's not mandatory to make life consultancy? I mean, that's why it was invented. That's why it was established. Why not making approaching life mandatory? And this, by this, you are going to um, make sure that the independence uh, requirement is going to be satisfied. So if it's important for you, that's part of the law, why don't you implement it in such a way that is going to be meaningful? Now when it comes to the issue of children, I said that I have three things that I would change in the law. First, I told you that I changed my mind and now I believe that uh, children can have discernment at certain age. But I don't think that that means that the age issue should be just absent. I think that it should be age criteria. And for my studies, there is something that's called the rule of seven. So infants are from under the age of seven, children are seven to 14, and adolescents are over 14. This is something that, that research tells us, and this is research in brain sciences, the development of the brain. So I think that Belgium should limit the age to 14. I don't think that a, uh, a kid by the age of nine or 10 is sufficiently discernment to decide the moment of his or her death. I think it's that premature. So I would put at the age criteria. I would put the age criteria even as a sort of um, a sign or as a flag for the doctors around the patient bed. It doesn't mean that necessarily if I'm saying 14 and the, and the patient is 13, that they are not going to do that if they see that all the requirements as far as they can see, the, 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 the kid can do, can understand what's going on and maybe deserve euthanasia. But at least it will give you some guideline. And without the guideline, I think that it's too open, too open-ended. So I think that should be age criteria. Um, so that's the, the, the adolescent stuff. Um, okay, talked about that. The option of uh, pediatric palliative care should be exhausted before proceeding to euthanasia, as it should be for all cases of euthanasia for adults. Psychological counseling, at present, the law specified it has to do to the patient. I'm told that usually it's also provided for the parents if they want it. I think it should be ma made mandatory for, in the law for, to provide this for the, the patient's guardian. They're going to lose a, a kid. They're going to lose their child. They need counseling. I can't even imagine what, what does it mean? How does it feel to, to lose a child? I, it's a nightmare. I don't, I don't want to go there, but uh, I, I find that just putting this as an option I don't think that's the right thing. I, should be, I think it should be mandatory. And also the law should insist on consensus between the child and the parents. Because again, it's an open-ended. What happens if the father yes, said yes and the mother says no? Who is going to resolve this thing? 
Of course, it's going to be the doctors who are going to resolve this thing. But I want to insist on consensus. So if one parent says no, then for me, it's a no. Um, OK, so that's something that I covered. And the consensus I covered. Monitoring. So all of them should be scrutinized, examined, monitored, studied carefully. I said I have loopholes. I'm sure that if I'll have more data, I will have even more information that I would like to ask. And this is the issue of the, of the, of the commission and this is just simply unattainable. I mean, I don't understand how can it be. The champion of euthanasia in the country, Mr. Euthanasia, is the, cha or is the chairman of the control committee. I mean, well, it's ridiculous. You find it all kind of banana republic in South America or Africa or God knows where. But in, in Europe? I mean, can you imagine that something like this is going to happen here? We have a scandal of MPs that are taking money to their pockets and uh, advising all kinds of expenditure. And we are going to the, the, the one who stole the most more money. We're going to be the chairperson of the committee to study the, the, the tariffs. I mean, what's going on here? How can it be? How can it be that they don't see that there's a clear conflict of interest? How can you make the champion of euthanasia the judge of all cases? Of course I know what's going to this decision be. Zero. Zero abuse he found. And he's been around since 2002. So something that is, I mean, Belgium on other issues, it's, it's not that corrupt, but on this issue, uh, they don't see that it's something that is puzzling. The issue of the attending physician, the GP, the GP in Belgium and also in the Netherlands, uh, they, they know the patients well. It's like more or less the GP in, in, in England, but I think it's even closer. Uh, because the GP goes home often time and we are talking about really trust uh, relationship often time that can last for 20 or 30 years. That person should need to be consulted, should be involved in decision making processes. I'm not saying that uh, he or she is not, but because of the loopholes we don't really know of, our, of all the cases whether he's always consulted, is always in the loop, uh, whether the, what the family wants, what does he want and so on. So I want more information about that. When we're talking about decision-making processes, I want the stakeholders to be present and to be part of the consultation. So I want to see physicians, I want to see nurses, I want to see social workers, I want to see mental health professionals, I want to see rehabilitation therapists, I want to see community-based agencies, all of them should be involved in decision-making processes. So I want to, be, to have a sort of a comprehensive uh, team to make the decision. I want more information about uh, Wallonia. I don't understand why we know very little and that why the Belgians are not troubled by the fact that a large part, a large section of the country is actually unknown when it comes to euthanasia. So I'm coming to my conclusion, final words. Although the rationale of euthanasia is primarily liberal and speaks about the autonomy of the patients, we, still a lot of, we find still a lot of paternalism in Belgium. And it was clear to me, talking to very senior physicians, they know what the patients need. Um, um, they should decide uh, the end of life issues for patients. Um, they are the most important figures. Even if the patient and the family say something, if they say something else, they are going to prevail. So we find a lot of paternalism. It's of course contradictory to the entire zone data of euthanasia, but still exists. Um, Emphasizing palliative care, holistic care, compassionate, addressing all the physical, psychological, existential, spiritual, spiritual aspects that are involved in the issue of dying. Euthanasia should be only as a last resort. No shortcuts, not saving time, not saving money. It has to be after you exhausted everything, including palliative care, and then you can consider euthanasia. So it's not the first in the line, it should be the last in the line. Thank you very much.